Disrupted. Welcome to Book Interrupted. During this author's spotlight, we're talking to Chris Donaldson in his book, Going the Wrong Way, and it's a memoir. Is that correct, Chris, a memoir? That's, that's right, yeah. Welcome to the show, Chris. Let us know why you think we should read your book. Well, it's the most main thing. It's got 1,300 five-star reviews on Amazon, which is pretty pretty incredible at the moment, I think. So uh, we should get a prize for taking the longest time to write a book. It took me 40 years to write it in the end. But uh, so to really start off at the beginning, I was bought and brought up in Belfast in the 60s and 70s. And it was pretty crap place to be brought up, really, because it was bombs going off, people getting shot, all sorts of things going on at the time. So it got to the stage of finished education. Like a lot of Irish people, we want to get out of town and see the world. So I decided I want to go to Australia on a motorbike for some reason, which uh, I can't quite work out yet. But it was really, but motorbike, motorbike was really just a means to the end to see the world and get to Australia. It was in October, November 79, I left. And I got as far as London and the Ayatollah Khomeini took over the American embassy in uh, Tehran, basically closed off Iran. So I couldn't go east. Um, so I ended up going south just to get the heat, find the sun, went through the Middle East, drove across the Sahara Desert, ended up in Cape Town in the middle of apartheid. After various... Uh, Adventures. I got a job in a sailing yacht, then sailing back up to Europe, and got the bike shipped to the states. Uh, rode up to Canada and then down through the states, through Central America. Ended up in Argentina. So about that time, I started. I'd been writing journals and started writing a manuscript. At that stage, when I got home, I was 23, 22, 23, and then um, another guy wrote a book about riding a motorcycle around the world. And I thought, well, there's no point in me doing it now. There's no point in having two books about the same thing, <laughs> in my <laughs> innocence. So uh, it was only after I realized his book was completely different because he was a 45-year-old journalist and author writing, writing a book about riding around the world, whereas I was just basically a student and not a very good one either. <laughs> so I parked down my manuscripts in the bottom drawer and forgot about it for 40 years. And then... Um, a couple other people started doing similar trips, uh, Ian McGregor, people like that, and writing books about it. So I thought, well, I've got to get mine finished. So I ended up finishing the, writing the book at the age of 62, 63. I'm now 66. Um, that was really unique because I was able to read my journals and my uh, manuscript that I'd written 40 years before and have a laugh at myself. <laughs> and see what it got into it. So I was able to put sort of my years of experience on top of the perspective of the young guy. So it's written as a yeah. viewpoint of a 21-year-old, 20, but with my wealth of experience in life at <laughs> <you know, laughs> university since then. So it was quite an incredible journey, I suppose, just to write the book, going from my old journals and photographs and notes and stuff that I'd made. Um it was really nearly as if I was looking, reading the book, the story about somebody else, not myself at all. So it was quite nice, quite nice to know too that even though a lot of the stories were forty years old, and I hadn't thought about it for many years, that I was amazed how much came back to my brain. It's obviously fogged with forty years of too much alcohol and that sort of thing. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> going on. Um, it was very emotional sometimes to actually be able to look at the photographs and remember what was happening and had notes to go off as well. So it is quite a unique book, I think, from that perspective. I don't know if this is a spoiler, but I'm going to ask it. And if you don't want to reveal, that is perfectly OK. So did you make it to Australia on that trip or no? Well, I may as well say I didn't make it on that trip, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> which is the whole know. idea of it. Sort of, well, it's a bit of a giveaway in the title going the wrong way because I ended up in Argentina instead of Australia. So you can't go <laughs> far, further wrong than that. Um, and it's about all the, because I went a journey that I hadn't prepared for at all. The journey I prepared for was, was finished. So I had to go to Africa without any notion of what was in Africa, how I was going to cross borders. I mean, driving across the desert on a, on a, motor, a road bike. I don't know if you know much about motorbikes, but it's just the wrong. It's like going desert, desert driving in a Ferrari. 
it's just not what you do, you know. <laughs> I know so I was thinking when you said you drove through the Sahara because I'm in Senegal. Yeah. Um, they, I was like, how did he on a motorbike drive through the desert? Like that is that is serious. It was it's pretty a nuts, serious yeah. adventure. I mean, some days we would have done it was traveling in a convoy, but some days we would have covered maybe 10 miles after pushing, digging, and shoveling the whole way. Still only covered 10 miles, but it, so it was, it was pretty hard going. And then through the rest of Sudan, it was pretty grim as well. There's maybe 600 miles between petrol stations. So you'd have to carry all the petrol to cover you for 600 miles down a dirt road. So I would like to do it again, but in fact, it is another spoiler. <laughs> Uh, whenever it published the book, somebody one of my mates said, well, you never actually got this trailer. Why don't you have another go? So I still had the original motorbike in the garage. So pulled it out, parted it up a bit. And the trailer was set off for Australia two years ago, just after COVID. Did so, you? I finally, that was so I finally made it on the same motorbike 40 years later. finally got the trailer, which I left in 79. So it's a bit of a record breaker, slow trip as well. <laughs> but you got there. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. That I love the bike's actually. And I like out. that. Um, I was wondering about the motorbike because when it said Belfast to Australia, I was like, "How are you going to get the motorbike over the ocean?" But I guess you ship it. You, you have just to ship, ship it. Yeah. And... Well, Myanmar has been closed off for years and years, so basically you have to ship from India to Australia. So it's. I mean, you can't, as you say, there's too much sea to ride a motorbike around the world. You can sail around the world, you can fly around it, but you can't actually drive. You can't actually no. go up and down it much easier. You know, you can go from Belfast to Cape Town, from Canada to South America. But um, that's a different story. But yeah, whenever yeah. I started writing the book, I realized it wasn't just a geographical going the wrong way. Um, it was actually the story of my life. Very often, I've taken the road less traveled is probably a more popular term for taking the road that the route that everybody sort of avoids and the reason they avoid that is because it's a more difficult life challenge to travel with but uh, what I want to tell in the book was that even though it's more difficult it's much more rewarding to actually put yourself through those challenges and to come out the other side so it's a bit of a philosophical coming of age story as well no I, I would agree with that 100% the the greatest adventures are the ones that people usually say well what why would you do that yeah what if you don't like it what if you let this happen what and he's like well what if it doesn't what if it's like i have this amazing adventure in my life yeah and well you I mean you can, you can fly from london to australia from belfast to australia without any hardship at all you know <laughs> so you really are yeah. putting yourself through some sort of sadomasochistic experience <laughs> But uh, going going the wrong way. It was a bit. It's a bit of a coming of age story. Left when I was twenty one, turning twenty two, and put myself against all the challenges that I could find, basically. Um, and reading about it when you're writing about reading when you're sixty five, I'm at the other level end of the um, the working environment, if you like, sort of retiring now. So it's a different uh, perspective altogether. But just a, probably just as yeah. challenging a time, retirement, going into retirement rather than going into um, just the opposite. Of age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think also, though, it, in my experience, it's easier to make that jump when you're young because you don't really think about the consequences as much. Yeah, <laughs> you don't think about the consequences. You think you're, 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 you're you can't be stopped. You think you're invincible at that stage when you're 21. It's only when you get to 60, you realize, oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. But, um, and my next book will be entering into that really about why older people lose, nearly lose the will to live. They stop when they retire, they, especially men. They, they've they identified themselves with their work for 40 years and all of a sudden overnight they stop work and they sit in the garden and play golf. So this is a big life change. But that's the next book. I have to wait another 40 years I for that one. That, that, I like that that's what you did when you were in retirement age. You went back and looked at this amazing adventure and then reflected with the person you've become, which is basically this adventure molded you into Yeah. and how it affected who you are. And I think that's really amazing. Yeah, actually. I mean, I've, I've um, been through some fairly dodgy times with business-wise 
worked for as an entrepreneur, had arguments with the banks, as a lot of people had in a, in a property crash. But it's always given me confidence that even I'm standing in front of a judge in a position of fighting for my business. I just think, well, this is maybe difficult, but it's not as difficult as driving across the Sahara Desert. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's always given me the like, confidence to be able to go back at. Yeah, it makes you definitely have more endurance for life. Mm -hmm. for and sure. funny enough, reading some of my reviews, um, they've been quite touching. The one guy said he was able; his son was having spinal surgery and going through a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. It's about twenty different operations on it at this stage. And he wrote to me to say he was able to read my book to his son and give him confidence and helped him give him the ability to hang on there to, to go another mile, to get another, to go through another operation. So it's quite touching on some of the other ones' reviews have come to that sort of um, opinion as well. So it's been nice. Yeah, you're in, it's an inspiration, right? Like it gives people hope and maybe it'll even push some people into finally chasing their dreams right yeah well that's the idea in a way because people got so health and safety conscious these days um and risk adverse they'd rather watch it on tv than actually go out there and do it and as i say if i can ride a motorbike at 2021 with no no experience of travel no, not even knowing I mean, at one stage i think it was south of sudan I actually drove off the edge of my map into Uganda, I had to find somebody coming the other way to swap maps around, you know. It's before GPS, obviously, before the internet, so everything was much more, um, you'll find it, find out when you get there, you know. Yeah, and I think that's a, what you said is true. I think that people sitting home and watching, I think it's leading, like just watching things on, like characters having experiences on tv or actual people having experience on tv and not having any experiences of them yeah. themselves leads to people kind of being depressed and not yeah you know, even not... The, very often the people that if you're watching an adventure program like top gear they've driven the motor car to i don't know if you have it in canada driven the cars to the arctic circle yeah. and across the deserts and so on they went down to argentina a few years ago and they got into trouble with the local police and stuff. But it's only when you read about it, they actually had, there weren't, there's three of them on the camera, but there's about 50 of a backup looking after them, their money, their health, their security and everything else, which is, no, no. They, they're going down the same road. It's a different road. If you're on your own and you've only got so much limited resources, it's a very different experience. I know my husband actually is always saying that when I'm watching something, I'm like, can you believe this? He's like, who's videotaping that? I was like, oh, exactly. right alone someone is there with a mic and a camera and maybe there's a crew and if something really bad had happened it's just they're okay. yeah, yeah yeah they're yeah. not having a real adventure they're having a safety net adventure whereas if you're yeah. one, one guy standing on the border in africa with you against the rest of the world you've, you've got yourself into the situation now you've got to get yourself out of it you know it's nobody else to back you up yeah totally and i, I read um on your website that you said you got trapped in Syria, Jordan, and Israel. Is that right? How did that happen? I took a boat to um, to Israel because there'd been a ceasefire with Egypt and Jordan at that stage, uh, thinking we could just drive to Egypt, but they wouldn't let us out over the border because it was still, I mean, there's still trenches across the road. So the, the ceasefire had been signed, but they hadn't practically implemented it yet. So I had to go back to Cyprus over to Jordan, Syria which wasn't much better than it is now and through Jordan. So it was a, just sort of a bit of a roundabout tour wow, of the Middle East. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think that it is different because a lot of people are watching these kind of shows. It's just making me think if they read their your book, they're going to see what a real, like a real, you're not, like you're, they can visualize what you're going through because it's actually a real yeah. experience rather than uh you know, I feel like we filter things so much, like everything now, like yeah. even camera filters, like everything's so made of. I can't believe anything. Well, you used, to, you used to say the camera never lies, but the camera does lie now. Even movies lie because oh, of wow. yeah, 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 AI into it. But yeah, um, and certainly the whole book writing experience was great because it was self published, the book. So 
I got a couple of editors to go through. I got edited after me, I've written it. And then I'd have a ride with the editor because they wanted to take this out, some pieces out of it. I said, well, you can't do that because that's what makes a story, you know, even though it's maybe not quite as um, polished that you would like. Mine's much more, it's a bit of raw as a 21 year old would see the world rather than as a 60 year old or a 50 year old editor sitting in an office in London would, would see it. So it's, I think it's been quite a refreshing blast of uh, interest. Certainly the reviews are backing that up in a way. That's great. I love that. So how long did, did you do the adventure for before you came back home? Like how uh, long but, were you gone? But a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. So it was, and in those days, I, mean, I remember if you wanted to phone home from Africa somewhere, from Egypt, for instance, you had to book your call the day before. It cost about five pounds or about $50 now to make a five minute call home, you know. Whereas when I drove to Australia last year, you've got your mobile, you've got WhatsApp, you can phone home at any time you want. Your GPS show you where to go. You can Google the time next time to see where the next hotel is going to be. And I think the journey I made is probably one of the last more to tune with the, the old Victorian explorers, if you like, who disappeared for months at hand. Nobody knew where they were. Whereas now everybody knows where everybody is. You know, my, my wife is able to, my, ch my child was able to go on an application on the phone. Now you actually see me driving across Iran, you know. So they actually, it's just, it's just amazing that what has actually happened in the last 30, 40 years. I remember, I re same thing. We used to call relatives and I remember my grandparents, whenever I called them, they'd be like, okay, you gotta get off the phone. It's gonna go over this certain time yeah. amount and then they'll charge us extra. And we'd be like, okay, I love you, bye. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I remember when we went to China, me and my husband went to China, I guess about 15 years ago now. And they had just started with the smartphones and I had my first iPhone and it was yeah. the first iPhone. It was like tiny. And uh, I remember I got lost and he's like, no problem. There's this thing. I can go on my computer and it says, where's my phone? And I can find you because I was yeah. trying to like look at a map. I'm like, I'm completely lost in Shanghai. I don't know where I am. He's like, I'm looking on here. And I remember thinking, this is going to change the whole world. You can find me just because yeah. I'm talking to you on my phone, like totally different. And I was on the road sales rep when I was younger and the map books I had in my car, like marking off all uh, my yeah. accounts. <laughs> totally different now. I just like type in an address yeah. and <laughs> off I go. By navigating yourself, you'd find a, you build up a sense of direction. You know, you drive in a city and you think, well, I think it's up that way, but it might, it might be, might not be. But you think it's that way, and very often you're not far wrong. Whereas I think kids now, nobody ever has to do that anymore. You're just going somewhere, you just put a log into your GPS. And, and sometimes you you think, well, how did I actually get here? You can't actually remember the the road you took because you're just following that nice lady telling you to turn left, turn right. Completely. When I go to Canada, like I've even asked, told people directions saying, oh, if you go north. And they're like, which way's north? They don't even know no. what direction north, south, east, or west is, where they're standing. Yeah. And I think that's because the GPS, they just, people don't have to think about that anymore. So that's not something that their memory or their mind has to calculate. Yeah, level, level of navigating, which is not in your brain anymore. <laughs> you just do what you're told. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, there's that to it as well. But so many other things have changed with the internet, as I say, with I mean, nobody goes to a restaurant now without checking the reviews for it, that sort of thing. You know, you're just simple as that. You don't, nobody goes anywhere without checking, without making sure it's the right place and the right, getting the best value, or whatever. You know, it's, sometimes it's nice just to go, as I say, the road less traveled or the wrong way. And writing the book, I did realize that whether I would have done or not, but uh, for various periods in my life, I have picked a harder route to. To, make, to go down uh, just for the fun of it well I think it builds character too and I was reading something somewhere that said like purposely taking a different route yeah. can lead you to it can literally change your, like your life Yeah, just going a different route 
You know, you yeah, can run into someone, meet someone, find a place. Like things change if you try something different, but because you're so programmed just to like follow what the yeah. technology says that you never do. So you never have any new experiences. You just are like making your bubble smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a reaction against people don't like having too much of adventure, don't like the uncertainty of things, want to have everything planned. And you know. so the guy, when I went away two years ago, there's two of us, the guy whose idea it was for me to go to Australia this time, he got halfway there, we got to Israel, and he decided to come home because he thought it's not worth the risk, not worth the, the adventure. And he's probably right. <laughs> you know what do you, what do you gain from riding your motorbike to Australia? Really, it's it's a stupid thing to do, you know, because it's an fly there, you take a bus, a train, whatever. It is probably the stupidest thing you can do, but again, the most rewarding as well because if you're on a motorbike, it's very easy for people to come over and talk to you. And if you drive into a small town, uh, so you get much better reaction than you're on your own. You're there. You're you don't have to wind down a window uh, to speak to people. You can. You're just there and it's an immediate contact with them. But uh, yeah, it's not the not the smartest thing to do. <laughs> but it's a great story. And that's all that story. matters. Really. <laughs> well, I read somewhere that the best story is how something goes wrong very early on in the trip and they spend the next sort of reading the book. The, the author's trying to get his way out of these situations. So there's certainly a lot of situations I ended up having difficulty getting out of. <laughs> I know you're you're here to write it, so it worked yeah. out. Well, exactly. Yeah. That's, you can't, the uh, the secret plot of the story is I didn't die. I made it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, well, that's all we have time for uh, during this mini episode. So, readers, if you'd like to uh, pick up this book, it's called Going the Wrong Way. And it's Chris Donaldson's book, where he tried to go from Belfast to Australia. You can find it on our website at www.bookinterrupted.com slash shop. And we have a section called Author Spotlight, and you can find his book there. You can also find a link to his website and his book on our show notes below. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, it's Thank also so an audiobook. I don't know if you, don't know if you guys approve of audiobooks, do you? Oh no, yeah, audiobooks for sure. It's in an audiobook. Yeah, it's an audiobook as well. Yeah. Perfect. No, we we all of us. We actually, there's only one member on Book Interrupted that's held out and has never listened to an audiobook. But um, we are slowly. I'm a big audiobook person. I I'm constantly mm -hmm. reading an actual book and listening to an audiobook at all times. <laughs> That's yeah, all I ever do. Yeah, some people have so both you can also pick up the audio book. Yeah. Great. And is audiobook also available on Amazon or just on Amazon as well? Yeah, it's in hardback, paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon. Great. Yeah. So we'll put the link for the Amazon page on our website. And you can listen, read, scroll Chris's book. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you. If you've enjoyed these video highlights, listen to the full episode on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. Remember to like and subscribe and ring that bell to be notified when new episodes are published. Find out more by going to www.bookinterrupted.com. And we're gonna talk it out. On book, on book interrupted. interrupted.